We're giving our attention to God's word in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, This is the third part of our series on strategy, uh, how we do the work that God entrusts us to do. And today we're thinking about our part. Uh, We've thought about how uh, we need to speak God's word because it's God's word that changes people. Uh, We've thought about prayer uh, and how God uses prayer to change uh, people's hearts. Uh, And today we're thinking about what we do as people uh, to share in the work God gives us. I suppose the question for you and for me is, does what we do matter? Uh, Sometimes you get the impression uh, in church uh, that everything is on God and that he is the only one who does anything. That because he is sovereign and in charge and in control, that we just get to sit and watch. Uh, And yet in Acts chapter 18, that's not what we found, was it? Uh, Paul didn't sit in Damascus where he'd been converted and wait for the second coming. Uh, He and the church got busy. Uh, They sent people with good news to other places Uh, and uh, they did the hard work of declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, So what about you and me as part of God's church? Is there something for us to do? Uh, Does it matter whether we do what we're called to? Uh, There's uh, uh, really a a tension there, I think, between being faithful, uh, faithfully holding on to the truth, uh, and being fruitful as a church, uh, seeing people saved. And and sometimes we pit the two against each other. Uh, There's a long history of churches that go after fruitfulness, and they fill their buildings, uh, and the way that they do it is to compromise on the truth. They give up faithfulness so that they can be big and fruitful. But I suspect in uh, our part of the Christian world, we overreact and go the other way. Uh, As churches and as individuals, we say, well, the most important thing to do is be faithful. And we give up any thought that one day there might be fruit from our faithfulness. Uh, Our Christian lives shrink, our prayers shrink, as we thought about last time. Uh, We end up redefining success as a church as survival. So long as we're not the ones to switch off the lights, lock the door the last time, well, at least we've been faithful. Uh, But what if God expects both? Uh, What if God is calling us as his people to be faithful, not changing the gospel, but expecting the gospel that is the power of God to salvation to those who believe, expecting our faithfulness will produce fruit? What would that change in the way we act, in the priorities we have as God's people, what what would we do differently? Well, I want to convince you today that uh, the way we work and the things we prioritise do matter. I want to convince you to work believing that God uses your work, uh, to bear witness to Jesus, believing that he will use that, uh, to pursue faithfulness that bears fruit. Uh, That's the point uh, of where we're going today. And so we've got our little summary sentence up on on the screen there. You might like to say it with me. Work, believing God uses your work. And we're going to think then about our work, the bit we do, God's work, the bit he alone can do, and how they fit together. You'll see the outline there in the bulletin. Uh, and on the screen as we work through. First of all, uh, what is our work? What is our work? 
Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul uh, is writing to a difficult church, uh, a divided church, uh, and he diagnoses the cause of that division uh, in their spiritual maturity. Uh, In the opening couple of verses, he points out uh, that he had to give them milk, not solid food. Uh, They needed the, the truth pre-digested for them because rather than working together like a church, they were forming their fan clubs for their favourite ministers or pastors or teachers. Some were following Paul, others followed Apollos, who also had a fruitful ministry there in Corinth. Paul isn't glad to be a Christian celebrity, though, and he redirects their attention to the work that God has called them to do. Uh, He says in verse 5, After all, what is Apollos? What is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned each his task. Uh, Paul uh, is reminding us of what we need to keep focus on that God gives us a job to do as his people. Whether we're pastors, elders, teachers, whether we lead a Bible study, if we care for people and visit them, uh, if we tell unbelievers about Jesus, if our ministry is to pray for other people, that whatever work it is he gives us to do, that's God's work that we're responsible to him for. Uh, He sends us as his people to share in his mission. And Paul, first of all, is calling us to be faithful to that. Uh, If we have a Lord who assigns us a task, we're called to do it faithfully. But notice what happens as we are faithfully doing our task in verse 6, as we plant the seed, or water it, God makes it grow. As we are faithful, God brings the fruit. Uh, Some of us have different roles. Paul uses this illustration from farming, uh, where one is the sower, another one comes along later and cares for the plants. Uh, It's hard work. Never driven a header or a cedar, but I know farming is hard work uh, and we have work to do. Some with uh, a range of different tasks, but all of it aiming at the same purpose. Notice that in verses 8 and 9. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose and they will each be rewarded according to their labour. See, I've, I've never known a farmer who, uh, around this time of the year, pulls the, uh, the cedar into the shed and says, you know, that's the best field I've ever sown. All of those seeds are just the right distance from the bottom of the ground. Oh, they're in the straightest lines I've ever planted. I could retire now. You know any farmer who does that? What are they looking forward to? The harvest. They want to bring the crop in. The work isn't done until Christmas time, is it? And when the header goes out and takes the top off and it's all back in the shed or on its way to the depot, then they breathe a sigh of relief. The planting is the start And there's so much else, the watering, the harvest, the uh, fertilising and then the harvest. The farmer cares whether he gets a crop out of all of his work. And so should we. Uh, Like a farmer, we can't determine how big the yield will be for our effort. But man, we want to work hard so that there is a return on our crop on our sowing. Uh, Andrew Hurd is a a pastor of a church up in 
New South Wales on the Central Coast. He's written a, a book about this recently. And he had this to say, we cannot be content just to be faithful if we mean faithfulness with no regard for the growth of God's church. And we don't want to be the farmer who just puts the seed in the ground in the straightest rows they've ever been. We want the crop to grow. Is that the purpose we have? As Paul describes it here in verse 8, he says that whether we're planting, whether we're watering, we've got one goal, one purpose, to see the harvest brought in. Is that what we're working for? That we would do the work God has assigned to us. That's our work, our job. It takes effort. It takes energy. And ultimately it relies on what God is doing. So we're going secondly uh, to think about what God does. Uh, We could think uh, by emphasising the work we do that it's all on us. But what about God's work? What does he do? Well, we've noticed already in verse 5, he is the one who assigns the task. He's the one who says, this is what you should do as Christians. But now the Presbyterian Church, here's your job. Go and make disciples. It's he who sends us out into the harvest field, as he says in Matthew 9.38. He assigns the work. We do the work. But look again at verse 6. Whether we're planting or watering, God is the one who is working, even now, actively making it grow. The results are his. As verse 7 says, neither the one who plants or the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. So do we believe that God is doing his work? Or do we believe he is cracking open unbelieving hearts, making people ready to listen, giving people life who are spiritually dead? Drawing people to Jesus, showing them that the answers, the things they need are found in him. Do we believe he's leading people to repent and giving them faith? That's God's work. Just like the farmer who puts the seed in the ground, ultimately he can't determine how much he'll get out of it. God determines the growth. Notice, though, he gives us grace to do our work. We are fellow workers in God's service, verse 9 says. It's God's field. And he goes on to use the illustration of a building as well in the verses that, that follow. He's the farmer invested in the crop. We're the workers. He sets the task and he gives the growth. But he reminds us uh, that God is just as invested, more invested in our fruitfulness than we are. He calls us to be faithful. He produces the results. We could labour that point a bit further, but uh, just notice that God is doing his work, the work that only we can do. Uh, Only he can do. Uh, In the verses that follow, Paul uh, changes his illustration from farming to building. Uh, And he points out uh, that his work was to lay the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Notice that in verse 11. Uh, I don't know who you get to do building work around your place, but you'd be pretty suspicious if they came in and said, yeah, um, Problems in the foundation will knock the whole house down and start again, particularly if only all you needed was a new door or change a window or something like that. And Jesus is the only foundation we need. Paul warns us against that kind of shonky builder who would rip out the foundation and put in a new one. Uh, We constantly face this temptation, though, 
thinking that we need a different foundation. Uh, we might think that, that life for us uh, comes from our Christian parents, Christian friends, that it's uh, our pastor really who is the one giving us life, chewing up uh, the word of God for us rather than us feeding ourselves. And Paul warns us against that not to be fed on the milk, but to be eating solid food. Jesus says, the one who hears his word and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds on the rock. And so we need not to lay our own foundation, but to build on the foundation of Jesus, the foundation God has already laid. Well, we've seen our work, we've seen God's work. Let's conclude by looking about how those two fit together just quickly at the end. It's not that we do a bit of work and God is independently over there doing something different. Uh, we are co-workers, fellow workers, as verse 9 says. Uh, we are working together, building as God calls us to build, sowing as he directs us to, responsible to be faithful for the work he gives us. Uh, Continuing with the building metaphor, he talks about uh, what we build being tested, that great day, that capital D day, that final day when our work will be put to the test. If we've built with Jesus, if we've built with good materials, what we build will last. But if we've built with human wisdom, with human resources, he tells us it will all be burnt up in the fire. We will survive, notice in verse 15. This isn't about building something good to work our way to heaven, building a good enough life to get saved. The builder, we're told in verse 15, will be saved even though he suffers loss. But we want to build something that will last. He warns us in the the verses that follow not to build according to the standards of this age, the wisdom of our world in verse 18 and 19, Uh, you can build all kinds of organisations the way our world does. Uh, Just give people what they want and you can have the the biggest bunch, the largest group, the church that seems to be bursting at the seams just by watering down the message. And so we want to avoid worldly methods, foolish and futile as they are, as they're described here. They're using the techniques of our world just to gain popularity. Or down in verse 21, he warns us of something even more useless, uh, building a church on human leaders. Uh, That's guaranteed to fail. Saw news this week, uh, the second largest church in the United States. Their pastor, Robert Morris, has resigned. He had been lying for decades about criminal abuse that he had carried out. Uh, And I'd just say as a general rule, you should watch out for anyone who puts their own face on the front of a book. That's often a giveaway that you're in bad territory. Uh, Paul agrees and no more boasting about human leaders because whatever we might want to depend on, not Paul, Apollos, Peter, all of that is ours. If we are Christ's, that's where he lands us. Here's the answer. Uh, Whether we are... Uh, chasing faithfulness, whether we're concerned about fruitfulness. The bottom line is, if we have Jesus, we have what we need. 
Uh, If we are not sure where to put the emphasis between being faithful and holding on to the truth or seeing lots of people come to join the church, what we need to do is look to Christ, not to look to different leaders, not to look to our world, not to look forward to the future that we could form. But in verse 23, realising that we belong to Christ and Christ is ours and he is God's. How fruitful should we be? Uh, so how faithful should we be? Well, we should be undyingly faithful to Jesus who died for us. How fruitful should we be? How many people should we want to see saved? We should be as fruitful as we can to Jesus who's given everything for us. Uh, he is the only one who managed to finish the task God gave He is the only one who has faithfully planted the seed and seen the fruit that God promised. Remember that last final night. Three years of ministry, a few followers still with him in the upper room. One has gone out to betray him already. The disciples are all about to disappear into the night. Jesus has been faithful, 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 faithful every day. Does he give up on the fruit? Does he say, oh, well, doesn't matter how it turns out. At least I've been faithful. No, in the upper room, he looks towards heaven and says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. You've granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you've given him. And then he says, I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And he goes on to pray later, not only for his disciples who are running away faithless, but for those who would believe in him through their word. Jesus holds on to the fruit. Jesus prays for fruit. He prays for the harvest that will come. He prays that as we are faithful, the seed will bear fruit. He prays that the Father would bring the growth as we speak and others believe through our message. So brothers and sisters, realise that today in our lives, Jesus is answering that prayer. Realise that today through his church, as small as it may seem, Jesus' prayer is being answered. He uses people like us, our little efforts, our feeble words, to bring new life, to bring forgiveness and transformation. Because as we sow the seed, he brings the growth. Well, we might feel that we're not up to the task, but Jesus is. We might feel we've been unfaithful. Well, Jesus is faithful. We might feel we've not borne the fruit that we should. Jesus is fruitful. We need to work, believing that God will use our work, our effort, our energy, and he'll bring the fruit from it. Well, let's ask for his grace then, whether we're planters, whether we're waterers, that he will bring the growth. Let's pray. Our loving God and Father, we thank you that uh, you call us and assign a task to us. We praise you for the privilege of being fellow workers with you. Uh, That uh, our faithfulness and our fruitfulness are both your concern. Help us not to be content with one or the other 
but to seek to hold on faithfully to the Lord Jesus with a desire, a passion, an excitement, a certainty that you will bring others to know and trust him through our witness. Our God as a church, we thank you that uh, for many years we've known faithful teaching, how we long to see fruit from that. Uh, Our God, as individuals, we have sought faithfully to talk to our family and friends. We wonder when the growth will come. But we trust you. It's your field. You are at work. How we long to see the seed breaking above the soil and the harvest brought in. Help us not to change our expectations or grow discouraged to give up on the fruit, on the crop, just because we haven't seen it yet. Our Father, we trust that you are bringing the growth and pray that you would use our energy and effort, our words, our testimony, that others too might be saved and find life in Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.